All right, good evening. Broadcasting for the IWC Self Synchronization Team. This is Self Sync Live. Good evening and welcome to our broadcast. I'm Michaela and I'll be your host for tonight's session. Also with us from our IWC Sync team is Dave, working behind the scenes making this broadcast happen. Before we start our show tonight with Rear Admiral Select Ashback, a little bit about what we do. The purpose of the IWC self-synchronization team is to share unclassified information to enhance our collective situational awareness and facilitate the development of a common Navy information warfare community culture by allowing us to better engage across disciplines and sub-communities amongst ourselves and with leaders from our community. The live sync sessions offer us a way to hear from and engage with members of our community we might not otherwise have the opportunity to interact with. The IWC Self Sync team is comprised of volunteers from all corners of the IWC to include active duty, reserve, officer, enlisted, civilians, all of us working together anonymously on your behalf. If we had lawyers, they'd probably tell us to read a disclaimer about the sponsorship of this broadcast, so here it is. The IWC Self Sync is an independent group not officially sponsored by the Department of Defense, the US Navy, or the information warfare community. And honestly, that independence makes us that much more effective. Again, to reiterate, the information and opinions presented in this forum by the IWC Self Sync team and our guests should not be construed as official in any way. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, let's move on to our show. Joining us tonight is Rear Admiral Select Kelly Ashback, currently serving as a Special Assistant to the Commander of Naval Information Forces, our community SICOM. She's an intelligence officer by training, but as she gives us a bit of her background and previous assignments, she'll see that she's truly a jack of all trades. The IW community has seen a lot of changes over the past few years, and we're very grateful to have the Admiral with us here tonight. So uh, to lend us her perspective, not only on past changes, but upcoming changes as well. So without, without further ado, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, ma'am. We're really glad to have you. Michaela, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to everybody tonight. Let's see, um, before we get to um, tonight's questions um, that uh, many of our community members have sent in, would you mind giving us a quick overview of your career, ma'am, and uh, what brought you to your current job today? Uh, certainly. I've uh, been in the Navy now for just over 26 years, and uh, I was commissioned out of uh, George Washington University, NROTC, uh, as an intelligence officer, um, and so served from the very beginning uh, in Intel. And I'm old enough now in the Navy that uh, I joined at a time when uh, women still couldn't go to sea, um, and so my initial operational assignment was with, with, with a P3 squadron. Uh, I had the good fortune to be sent out to Hawaii, um, but within about 10 days of arriving there, uh, ended up deployed to ADAC Alaska, uh, issued a parka, and uh, served as my CO set on the northern front uh, during uh, Operation uh, Desert Storm with my P3 squadron. Um, I've had uh, other operational assignments with uh, Amphibious Squadron when I was in 04. Uh, I was the N2 for Fibron 1. And I've also been the N2 for the Abraham Lincoln Strike Group, which was my most recent uh, afloat assignment, uh, deploying with them in uh, 2010, 2011 uh, to the Arabian Gulf. Uh, in terms of shore assignments, um, I had uh, the opportunity to serve at uh, the Joint Intelligence uh, Center Pacific out in Hawaii. Uh, I was able to do uh, training for uh, the fleet in the waterfront in San Diego as part of Tactical Training Group Pacific. Uh, I was a detailer uh, right after they relocated Bupers to Millington and so had the opportunity to serve uh, in Middle America uh, near the uh, Mississippi River. Um, I also had the opportunity to be in London when the Navy headquarters was still there and I'm still sad uh, that it's closed and uh, no longer available uh, as an assignment opportunity. And uh, then I did Special Operations Command, uh, I had the opportunity to do a fellowship in DC and uh, more recently was up on the OPNAV N2N6 staff and uh, staff working as the deputy director for ISR programs and capabilities before Alcard asked me to come serve as executive assistant. Um, and then with the uh, transition to uh, uh, a fully integrated information warfare community and cross detail opportunity, uh, when I was fortunate enough to screen for command, I was selected to go be the commanding officer at Nick Tam's Lant. 
uh, and served there uh, in, my, in my most recent operational assignment for two years. Uh, and then Admiral Kohler asked me to come over and be the chief of staff over at uh, the TICOM. Uh, and I served in that role for about 15 months uh, before having the honor of being uh, selected to the next level. And I'm currently still assisting with some special uh, projects there as I wait for uh, the next assignment. Wow, you've, you've truly served across the board. Um, and again, we're very fortunate to have you uh, with us tonight with um, all of your background. And I think I think just hearing about all the things that you've done kind of lends itself to the fact that there's so many uh, different career paths within the IW community, but yet all of them lead to such interesting and successful uh, careers and outcomes. So um, thank you for sharing all that with us. Uh, for your current job in uh, NAVI-4, um, it's a very new um, command. Can you tell us um, a little bit about what it is, um, kind of brief past, present, and future of NAV, uh, NAVI-4? I can. Um, you know, the uh, information warfare community has finally had the opportunity to establish its own type command. And I think many are familiar with the fact that the other warfare communities have mature uh, type commands that address and take care of the man, train, equip issues. Um, and as someone who's been um, a commanding officer, um, the, the intent of a type commander is really to um, benefit um, our ashore commands and our IW forces afloat in terms of allowing them to focus operationally while we assist in making sure they have everything they need to be most ready for their mission. And if we do our job right, uh, they simply have to identify, articulate, and justify why they might have a manning issue, why they might need better equipment or training. Uh, and then it's our job uh, to lean in to figure out what is the solution? Does it already exist? Um, do we have the money? Uh, is it a priority? Uh, and how do we deliver it to ensure that the forces that are serving either afloat or ashore are most ready to do their job? And again, if we get that right, we free all those individuals to focus their full-time efforts on the operational piece of the mission uh, and allow us in the background to take on the, uh, the policy fights, the money fights, um, the uh, technical development, uh, certifications, um, other things that need to happen administratively um, to make all that happen for them. I think I can speak for most, most NIOCs and um, uh, afloat commands and, uh, and thanking you for doing that for them because I know there's a lot of operations that go on and having more off their plate definitely helps. Um, I know that you've uh, prepared some information for us tonight to go over. Um, would you like to uh, begin that now and then if any questions come up from the audience, we can try and field those first before we get to some of our um, uh, pre-submitted questions. Uh, certainly, yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, move into uh, the slide overview. Um, and uh, if we go to the first slide, uh, in terms of the NAV I-4 mission, um, I already talked about the fact that our role as a type commander is about manning, training, and equip equipping. And the goal there is to ensure the best readiness uh, and sustainability for our forces, both afloat uh, and ashore. Uh, next slide. Uh, unlike some of the other uh, uh, TICOMs, um, we have a pretty um, broad scope. Um, we are one of only two global TICOMs. The Expeditionary um, Combat Command uh, is uh, the other global TICOM. Uh, the others are split by coasts, and uh, I guess you could argue maybe have an advantage that they can specialize uh, in terms of their fleet focus. But we take a global view of the support we provide for information warfare. Some of that's driven by the fact that, as many of you know, our architecture, our reach back, the way we connect and support is arguably global global and not regionally um, anchored. Um, but we have a phenomenal number of people who are out every day uh, in the heart of what's going on operationally, approximately 12,000 who are afloat. And within our domain, where we have uh, responsibility for about 73 operational shore commands, we have almost 15,000 IW professionals um, who are working every day um, to provide support for forces that are deployed. Um, provide training, et cetera, and our job is uh, to take care of them. Um, we have three operational commanders that we support as a type commander. Uh, one of them is uh, Fleet Cyber Command or 10th Fleet. Uh, we also have Office of Naval Intelligence, and then we take care of our meteorological and oceanographic commands uh, through CINMOC, uh, 
uh, down in Stennis. Um, as a TICOM, we are a little bit different uh, than the other TICOMs in that I uh, talked about our global role, but we're actually responsible globally for all of the Navy's networks. And that's regardless of whether the command or units we're supporting actually have a predominant IW flavor to them. We are charged with making sure that our float network, which is IT21 transitioning to Canes, and our ashore networks overseas OneNet and in CONUS NMCI um, are the best uh, capability we can provide that we're on a path to transition, hopefully to one contract globally for our shore support and that we're poised to um, integrate into the joint information environment. We also have a unique role on behalf of fleet forces that because uh, we have the predominant uh, support role for nuclear command and control on the communication side, which is a strategic mission on behalf of uh, uh, the uh, uh, US government, uh, we actually track readiness in that area across not just our domain, but other TICOMs, which include Air 4 and Sub 4 to provide fleet forces and pack fleet, at least on a monthly basis, um, an update on the status or readiness of uh, those forces. Uh, next slide. Uh, just to add to the scope of what we do, I've talked about the uh, mission areas, um, but in terms of our alignment, we do have 73 operational shore commands, and that is primarily where we're focused in terms of trying to make sure uh, we're leaning in as best we can to support. We work through our sister TICOMs, Air Force, Surf Force, and Sub Force, to support our IW component afloat. And although they don't directly, um, we're not directly responsible for them in terms of resourcing and training, we do um, provide advocacy um, and we uh, often are able to break down barriers, um, particularly if it involves delivering uh, solutions from Spay War or it involves providing additional weight or advocacy to bring resources to bear uh, and get OPNAV to provide funding. Our total obligation authority is 1.6 billion, which is a pretty substantial budget. And we have been pretty effective in bringing together the three operational commanders to now provide a combined uh, prioritized list of information warfare requirements. So that every year we work through a proce process with the operational commands to put forward a prior prioritized list of if OPNAV is going to spend another dollar, where do we want them to put it? And we truly have a number one uh, versus a number 10. And we do that both for equipment and systems as well as for manning. Uh, and then you can see there the total number of billets we have to support our mission. Um, pretty good size at 700, although I will say because we're still new, uh, we still are rather contract dependent and are optimistic going forward that hopefully we can turn some of that contract support into permanent presence and capacity uh, at the TICOM. Next slide. We have uh, some key objectives um, and initiatives that we're focused on, and a lot of this stems from the design for maintaining maritime superiority that the CNO published a year ago. If you haven't had a chance to read that, I highly encourage that you do. He puts a tremendous emphasis on the role of information warfare uh, and gave us very clear guidance uh, in our charter to further ingrain IW in the fleet um, to ensure we're being innovative and that we're providing the best capability uh, going forward. Uh, and so you can see here the things that Admiral Kohler as the head of the TICOM is focused on. We obviously want to ensure that we've got the best training uh, and that we are delivering uh, new systems and capabilities as quickly as we can. Um, one of the initiatives in this area is also uh, the IW Commander concept, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, on future slides. Uh, in terms of ingraining IW in the fleet, we are establishing the Information War Fighting Development Center. Uh, I've also got some follow-on slides on that. And we're trying to align electronic ma magnetic maneuver warfare with information warfare as we move forward and deliver uh, good insight and training uh, as we move forward and maturing uh, in both of those areas. And then finally, just as an enterprise and a TICOM, we continue to try and mature. Uh, we have established a West Coast presence and we continue to work on alignment issues across the operational commands and other commands like Spay War on ensuring we've integrated the man train and equip responsibilities in the best way possible, again, to allow the operational commanders and all the subordinate commands uh, to focus on operations. Next slide. I talked about the Information Warfighting Development Center. That's one of our key initiatives, uh, and we are on a path based on CNO direction uh, to stand that up. Uh, we do expect that the initial operational capability will be in March of this year. Uh, we were given that tasking when we were established. 
Um, other, the other TICOMs were given similar tasking, but we were given additional time to stand ours up based on the fact that we were formative as a TICOM. Uh, and so we do expect we'll have initial capacity in the spring and our final or FOC will be in April of uh, 2019. Next slide. As we went through the process of uh, working on the uh, um, IWDC, we did a lot of analysis and work with the operational commands uh, and other uh, commands out there that are already providing training. Uh, and we came to the conclusion that we really needed to establish an information warfare training continuum. And we needed two commands um, to provide uh, that support. And so in addition to establishing an information war fighting development center this spring, we are going to establish a training group to complement that uh, and take on uh, an effort to uh, provide a holistic training continuum for information warfare. Uh, and what this will do was build on the basic training that CWIT currently provides for our enlisted sailors and our officers. Uh, focus at the basic level out of the IWTG on ensuring they have the skills to deliver in basic mission areas for the units they're assigned to and build across the continuum up through the IWDC on more advanced and complex uh, uh, concepts. Ultimately, we hope that this will provide much more consistent and persistent support uh, across uh, the uh, information warfare continuum for both of our afloat forces and for our shore commands. And particularly with the IWDC, we all hope it will also um, promote and create better opportunities for innovation uh, in inter information warfare by bringing together our most talented uh, individuals. Uh, next slide. And this just gives you a sense of what the organization will look like. Um, the Information Warfighting Development Center and the IWD IWTG will be direct reports to NAV I-4. Uh, one will ultimately be led by a flag officer, the other by an 06. Um, and uh, you can see uh, the relationships that they will have in partnering uh, with the existing training that's done out of CWIT, working with the other warfighting development centers where we already have information warfare presence, and supporting our CSGs 4 and 15, as well as TACTRAE GRULANT and TACTRAE GRUPAC and the integrated training effort. Next slide. I want to talk about the um, Information Warfare Commander. Um, you can see on the slide here the evolution of where we, we've come from. Um, you know, I talked to the mid-career course this morning, and I, I really uh, tried to clarify to them that uh, what drived us to take a, a look at this again, although you could see on the continuum there was a lot of experimentation going on, um, we really felt that when CNO redefined Information Warfare last December, uh, that that was really a driver for us in coming back to what is the Information Warfare Commander. Information Warfare now, uh, under CNO's direction, includes all of our capabilities, uh, and we really felt it was imperative to ensure that we have a construct afloat that drives and promotes integration and readiness across the IW areas um, in the strike group environment. Um, and so we have a limited objective experiment underway right now with Strike Group 10, and we're building on work that was already happening in a number of the uh, strike groups where they were experimenting with different constructs uh, in order to get this right. Next slide. Ultimately, we're hoping to deliver a construct based on the fleet demand that would provide a template from which um, strike group commanders uh, could operate from. And it would really outline what we think is best practice in terms of integrating uh, our capabilities. Um, if it achieves uh, the goal that I'm hoping it'll achieve personally, it will be command um, and will give us a seat at the table in terms of uh, driving and integrating information with our capabilities. The intent is to retain all the goodness we already provide afloat, um, but provide advocacy at the 06 level on par with the other warfare commanders um, and really um, better define uh, the situations in which we would be supported uh, versus the supporting commander across the strike group for various missions. Um, and so we're hoping, based on the limited objective experiment, that we'll be able to deliver recommendations in partnership with NWDC in January that will allow us to move forward in addressing the man, train, and equip issues that are likely to come from that recommendation uh, and also start publishing concepts um, that would put doctrine out there on uh, how we would operate uh, in this form. Next slide. 
And these are just key takeaways in terms of what's going on with the Information Warfare Commander. Uh, there has been um, a lot of outreach on this effort, uh, internal to the community and also external, um, to ensure uh, that we get uh, the most input and information in order to shape an effective construct. Uh, so we are uh, set on trying to standardize that construct. Uh, our flag leadership has already moved to ensure that we're providing fully qualified IW commanders. We had our first screen board back in August. And right now we're screening uh, post 06 command captains for that position. Although we are going to be looking over time and how we move that opportunity to the left and perhaps put it on a par with a shore command is something you could do as a new 06. Uh, we do believe the IW commander could be supported or supporting and that'll work across mission areas. And so we don't see a negative impact in terms of support already be pr being provided to other warfare commanders. And that frankly, this again, would just provide better advocacy and further enhance uh, what we already deliver. Um, once we finish the LOE, we will be looking beyond that to figure out how we should be organized at the operational level in our maritime operational centers, and also looking at our ARGs uh, with Joint Strike Fighter being delivered there and the requirements they have on how the strike group construct uh, could inform uh, how they're organized. Next slide. And with that, um, Michaela, that uh, kind of concludes my quick summary of some of the key areas we're focused on from a TICOM perspective. I'm certainly happy to uh, address any questions uh, from the group. Um, absolutely, ma'am. Thank you for going over that. We did have several questions come up. So I'll start with Captain Heritage question. Um, when, what, when might we start measuring task force readiness in favor of um, command readiness uh, with regard to readiness? Now, that's a great question. Um, I know that um, Fleet Cyber Command and SINMOC have both organized themselves as a task force now, and uh, it probably is more suitable long term based on how they deliver operational capability for us to look at the task force holistically um, to measure readiness. Um, I will tell you, um, I think we um, have some work to do in maturing into that role. Um, we have uh, just completed the effort uh, this past summer of getting the Intel commands just into the readiness uh, system um, and are still working through the cycle of our initial assessments in the key um, functional or mission areas uh, inside the readiness system. And that's aligned right now with how U.S. Fleet Forces and PAC Fleet analyze readiness. Um, I think one of the things I'm hoping with the establishment of the IWDC and our continued maturation in this area is that we may be able to influence um, how we're measuring readiness. Right now it is still in some of the traditional um, mission areas as defined on how we operate afloat, meaning we look at Intel, we look at C2W, uh, we look at Triple Chuck, and we look at MeTalk. Um, and I think we probably need to think uh, in a more integrated fashion uh, about our mission areas and then also look at how we're organized uh, and how we measure that readiness. So I think it's a great point. Um, I don't, we, we don't have a near term uh, transition on that. And, um, and I think uh, we ought to uh, start that dialogue with the operational commanders on how um, over the next couple of years, we uh, influence a change to that and uh, get ourselves to transition to more effective reflection of how we're delivering uh, capability. All right, great. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we also had another question. Somebody noticed in one of the slides, it seems that there is um, differentiation being made for um, electromagnetic warfare and uh, information warfare vice um, EM falling under IW. Why is that? I would say that um, the slideology is poor then because our view is that EMW is a subcomponent of IW. Uh, and that we do see that as integrated in what we deliver from an information warfare perspective. And uh, it's certainly not the intent to suggest it was separate um, or a separate mission area. And um, we're pretty, uh, uh, pretty firm in our advocacy that um, the EMW uh, work that's been done, uh, the concepts there in terms of how we need to operate, our ability to maneuver and spectrum should be fully integrated uh, in information warfare. All right, thank you for uh, clarifying that. Um, I think we all appreciate that because um, all the things that we read or we read and all the literature has it falling under IW. So, um, but good catch whoever asked that question. Um, we have another anonymous question. Uh, what is the draw for someone to have a career path of Fleet N2 
uh, 06 Command, and then um, a strike group, uh, Information Warfare Commander afloat. Um, well, I guess I could speak to that one rather personally, because I, I can say having served as an N2, um, I love that job. I certainly think uh, as an intelligence professional, and especially at a time when I served at it, and not having a clear sight picture of where we would be five or six years after the time at which I was an N2, um, I think it creates tremendous opportunity in the sense that you can go back to C as an 06 now, uh, which is an Intel officer, and even in some of our other designators, I think with the exception of the IPs, there weren't opportunities at that level to serve afloat. And as we all know, the Navy's about going to sea, operating from the sea. Um, and I also think it allows you to build on what you've already done previously. So whether you're an N2, you're serving as a, a METOC or a DIWIC, uh, any one of those IW roles at the 05 level afloat, um, I think it gives you a chance to go back and uh, you know, take on a broader set of responsibilities um, and be an advocate um, for IW across the board, to sit at the table in terms of integration. Um, and in my, you know, my vision long term is that you know, we, I think you and I talked about this earlier, that you would set the table up front. And if you're doing your job right as an information warfare commander, you have the chance to drive that maybe all the assets in the strike group are, are uh, distributed uh, and disaggregated in a way to optimize all of the IW related uh, mission sets, which uh, include uh, ISR. Uh, and we would get to go first uh, because uh, our arguments and our uh, credibility are compelling enough that the striker commander would take our vote you know, over, over uh, some of the other warfare commanders. And certainly we'd be in a healthy dialogue all the time on that supported supporting relationship. But I think it's particularly attractive um, as a striker band two, you get a chance to serve. Um, you may get the chance to go be a fleet end two where you get to further build on your operational capacity. You could go to 06 Command, um, whether that's in Intel or cross detailing, uh, and then go back out afloat. Uh, and I only, I frankly personally regret that I'm senior enough that I'm actually missing the mark uh, on what's happening with the Information Warfare Commander right now. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, it does seem like uh, having had much more experience behind you, you would have uh, a greater voice at that table where they would actually listen. Um, to your recommendations and maybe um, put put that commander in the supported role, um, I think is what you're getting at. So that, that would be very cool to see. Um, with that, are we starting to see any of um, that with having Captain Braswell out as um, an IW commander at float? Are we, are we seeing maybe the, um, the tables turning a little bit in terms of information warfare, getting more support uh, and on that front? Uh, I, I think so. Um, unfortunately, in the unclassified level, I can't talk uh, specifically to some of the vignettes that I've seen, but I think um, we have accumulated and already gathered data to suggest that there are um, several instances uh, where they have been the su supported commander, where Captain Braswell has been the one um, who has put together uh, operations um, that involve uh, maneuver across the spectrum, uh, perhaps involve um, collection operations uh, and where he has uh, had other warfare commanders leaning in to support him uh, and he has been the lead uh, as a warfare commander in that area and then certainly lots of examples where he's leaning in to provide others. The feedback from uh, Admiral Wilson uh, who left I guess mid-deployment as a strike group commander um, he had um, really high reviews of how this new construct uh, for him, he felt uh, uh, enhanced what he was getting from information warfare um, and uh, promoted, you know, further in integration of all the capabilities. Um, you know, one of the examples that, that uh, I'm aware of, uh, Captain Braswell talks about the fact that because the METOC officer is working for him as the IW commander and not working in the N3, uh, there, the METOC officer is able to focus on providing space support and expertise where they would normally be spending that time working on uh, navigation uh, and PIM uh, plans and updates for the strike group in the N3. Um, and that's just one example. Um, but, uh, but I think um, there's a lot of positive feedback uh, out there so far. And certainly our limited objective experiment has been, was just out there last week to uh, 
capture more formally uh, the data and analysis uh, in addition to interviewing and talking to all the other strike groups uh, to ensure we've got a holistic picture um, and if when we put forward the concept proposal uh, that it's well informed by the lessons we're learning as we're operating. No, that's fantastic. Um, and it seems like that's where the IW communities hide it anyway, as you mentioned with I4 trying to take some of the um, responsibilities off in terms of, um, you know, that man train and equip piece. Um, we did have another question regarding that. Um, where does NAV I4 um, currently stand with assuming and formalizing the man train and equip responsibilities that have traditionally been retained at that uh, fleet cyber command and 10th fleet level? Um, as kind of a legacy holdover from the security group days? Well, we um, initially took on quite a uh, few responsibilities from them when we stood up, um, but clearly um, there were um, some upfront disagreements or hesitancy on what we took on respective to each of the operational commands. Um, and we worked through some of that during Admiral Tai's tenure. And then with the arrival of Admiral Gilday, um, he directed and invited another review uh, to examine what additional man, train, equip responsibilities uh, Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet should shed uh, in order to allow them to focus uh, even more effectively on operational capabilities. Um, so some of the things that we're going to be taking on in the next year, we were already on a path under Admiral Tai. Uh, some things are opening as new opportunities with Admiral Gilday uh, in a leadership position up there. Um, but a great example, the Cyber Mission Force, um, Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet retained responsibility uh, for that effort until the teams reach IOC. Um, but we are in the process of transitioning that. So ultimately the TICOM will be responsible from a man trained and equipped perspective for the cyber mission uh, force, uh, which you know rightly should be a, a TICOM lead. But given where we were in that stand up and how critical uh, that effort is, uh, Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet retained uh, that effort uh, to see it through uh, until they reach a certain point. We continue to talk to 10th Fleet about other things we can do, um, and particularly in terms of things like direct support uh, they continue to have um, a role uh, from a cryptologic standpoint in how we distribute uh, personnel and equipment uh, afloat. Uh, and we have been in dialogue with them over whether that's a role we should eventually take on. Um, there has been um, a lot of discussion and review to ensure that uh, that meets the intent of uh, NSA and Cyber Command in delegating responsibility as a service cryptologic element uh, to 10th Fleet. But my assessment is that we'll continue to see the transition of some of those responsibilities down to NAV I-4. Um, our only recent challenge has been that with um, the major headquarters activities uh, cuts, and I'm not sure everybody's familiar with the cuts that were directed by Department of Defense and the fact that we're standing up the IWDC, uh, the TICOM, you know, NAV I-4 is gonna be transitioning about 50 personnel over to the IWDC. Uh, with the stand up in March. The good news is that most of those folks are taking ex existing work with them. But simultaneous to that, we also have to cut 35 billets as part of the uh, headquarters drawdown. And so that has created um, just a near term challenge on how soon we can take on some of the additional responsibilities from Fleet Cyber Command. So I would tell you that I think the dialogue is very promising, but this is another area where I think we have more work to do. Um, and, um, and within, you know, information warfare, I think we still have some trust building to do in terms of our collective ability uh, to be confident that regardless of our designator or for members of information warfare, that we, that if it's our job responsibility, that we will be good custodians and advocates, um, regardless of whether we're, you know, from the original designator that um, we ought to be able to distribute and execute the MT&E responsibilities in a way that um, we should all be confident that they'll get done um, by the TICOM, you know, regardless of what flavor of IW is sitting in the seat engaging with you on, on your requirement. Great, ma'am. And it seems like um, with the recent trend um, that's now being pushed down to the uh, commander level for um, cross-dealing as exos, and um, additional cross-dealing that you got to participate in, uh, that will only add to that trust building in terms of you know, different designators getting to see what, um, what the other communities or sub-communities um, really do and, and being a part of that. So hopefully everything will continue to build on each other. Um, 
we had one question kind of going back to the end of the strike group. Um, what is what is that relationship between the IW commander and strike N2 going to look like? Um, if you could speak to that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I uh, strongly believe that if the IW commander uh, is trained well and is doing his job right, he's going to allow his supporting cast to execute for him. So frankly, having been an N2, I don't see the N2's role or responsibility changing um, other than they have the benefit of having now an 06 IW advocate in the form of an IW commander um, who can sit at the table with the other warfare commanders uh, on their behalf. And if we train properly and we put the, for the concept forward appropriately, um, it should allow the N2s uh, who are out there to continue to excel and deliver uh, the capability they've been delivering in the same manner and will just enhance and afford opportunity for even better advocacy. Um, you know, if your IW commander is smart, when he's got an intel issue, he's gonna have, you know, a chokehold around the N2 and make sure that the N2 is at uh, the meeting with him to talk about whatever the intelligence related issue is. And if the N2 is doing their job right, he will have the confidence of the IW commander to frankly represent the IW commander on Intel, you know, on Intel matters where he is the subject matter expert. But I think that applies to the other um, designators as well, meaning the DIWIC, um, the uh, the N6 uh, who's out there and the MeTalk, uh, that the IW commander will lean on them, that they are in some ways sort of his IW squadron leads, uh, you know, delivering capability in their respective areas. Um, and uh, and he, will, he will need to give them the autonomy and empower them uh, to do the jobs that they were sent there to do. And as a community, we'll continue to screen to make sure we send the best bench and the best people out there at that level um, to provide that support for him. All right, great. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, another question, still going off of um, what you presented earlier. Um, now that the IWC billets uh, are being shared uh, from the IP slate, what new options will be available for IPO sixes um, afloat? It seems in some areas we're pushing for the I IDC IWDC to have people dual hatted for a bit, and other areas afloat now people uh, aren't dual hatted and wondering what. Uh, what options are available for them at that point? Um, well, I would say we are sharing the billets with the IPs right now. We are using their billet to send an information warfare commander out there. We have work to do in figuring out how the other designators uh, fair share those billets and provide compensation to the IPs long term. Um, so right now the IPs um, still get the full benefit from a promotion standpoint of the existence of those 06 IP billets um, while we work through that. Uh, and it has no negative impact on their um, promotion percentage opportunity, if, that, if that, I think that's the right way for me to express, express it. Um, so their selection rate should not go down. Um, what we'll need to determine is if we turn some of those 06 IP billets into, say, three 06 uh, Intel billets and a few 06 uh, Cryptologic billets and maybe one 06 MeTalk billet based on the size of our community, is we'll need to consider the trades and where do we move the 06 IP compensation as a result. So there's no intent to give up the number of 06 billets we have by designator right now. I think we just need to examine how we make the trades and perhaps take the opportunity to invest those 06 IP billets in other places where we will look to pull an 06 Intel or 06 um, cryptologist uh, into the strike group and better distribute that billet base. I, and I think that work's going to take, you know, it's probably going to be another year with the analysis and the work that has to be done to determine how to execute that. And in the meantime, we continue to take the do no harm approach of um, we will not um, we will allow the IPs to still get full credit for the billet base um, while we sort that out. There's IPs in the audience. I'm sure that they're breathing a sigh of relief right now. <laughs> um, we had another question here. How how will uh, Nyack Norfolk and uh, San Diego change um, as a result of the um, the IWTG establishment? Well, that's a great question too. Um, I think. I think some of the folks in the audience are familiar with the fact that um, in standing up the IWDC and the IWTG, 
um, Nyack Norfolk and Nyack San Diego based on the nature of the work that they already do uh, and the kind of training they're providing on the waterfront um, have become a natural um, focal point for us um, in the establishment of the two commands. And although we are still working through the details with Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet um, for the final outcome, the expectation is that we are going to establish the IWDC and the IWTG by essentially carving out portions of Nyack Norfolk and Nyack San Diego. Um, and so we had already identified um, the WDC piece that is going to marry up with the 50 billets that we're providing from NAV I4 to create the foundation. Uh, I, I'll mention that, you know, CINMOC is providing its professional development center as its portion of the investment, and O&I is also investing billets. So that's coming together to form the WDC. On the TG side, uh, it looks like the remainder of Nyack Norfolk and Nyack San Diego uh, that the bulk of that will likely become the, the TG. What we're trying to sort out right now is there's obviously some operational capability that no Norfolk and San Diego have, particularly under their Task Force 1030 hat as part of 10th Fleet. They've got Nyad Groton, they've got responsibility for Whidbey. Um, and what we're trying to sort through right now is what operational capabilities need to remain uh, with 10th Fleet and perhaps be subordinated to another task force uh, as part of that and then what will coalesce and become the IWTG. And there are um, several COAs that were briefed earlier this month to Admiral Kohler and Admiral Gilday. In fact, Admiral Kohler was over at Nyack Norfolk again today to talk through um, how we're gonna move forward on that. And, and so um, the expectation is um, that, yeah, they will split. Exactly how that falls out um, remains to be determined, but essentially both will continue to do all the work they already do, they will just be better aligned in providing it across the IW continuum. The IWDC, we already have a really good plan on how to bring more into the Nyack Norfolk piece to turn it into a holistic um, command that addresses the breadth of IW. The TG, um, I would caution, will probably still be rather cryptologic, EWIO, um, dominant initially and we will have more analysis and work we'll need to do on how we build on that entity to add intel uh, me talk and other aspects of iw so there is a, a substantial amount of work frankly that probably still needs to be done on the tg piece um, since that that component came along later uh, in the development process with the wdc all right, uh, great, thank you, ma'am. Um, I think we're going to uh, skip to a couple questions that we had um, submitted earlier. Uh, the first being, what are your thoughts on the discussions regarding those with the uh, 1800 series designators um, becoming unrestricted line officers, or if it's more appropriate for certain designators, uh, vice others? Um, I would say that I'm, I know there's been a lot of discussion about the 18XX series becoming unrestricted line. Um, and I would say I'm not so much concerned about us becoming unrestricted line as I'm an advocate for, we need to be afforded the same opportunities as the unrestricted line. And so I use examples like, um, you know, for the unrestricted line, uh, they only assess or require to assess physically qualified individuals. Um, we serve in the same environments. We should have the same accession standards um, that uh, the unrestricted line has. Uh, we should be able to assess people directly out of the Naval Academy, um, you know, regardless of which IP or which IW designator it is. Um, we've made some ground there in our engagement, um, but Intel uh, and MeTalk in particular right now still don't get um, direct accessions uh, out of the Naval Academy, um, and yet we're compelled to take not physically qualified individuals uh, and integrate them uh, in our communities um, if they're you know, deemed um, uh, sufficient to get a commission or graduate out of the Naval Academy. So that's, uh, that's one example. I think when we talk about command at sea, if you're unrestricted line, 
uh, you can have command at sea. I think if we get it right and we're a warfighting domain as an information warfare commander, regardless of whether you're a restricted line in the information warfare community, um, we ought to be afforded the opportunity to take credit for command at sea. Uh, if we're leading in a warfighting area, if we're a supported commander, we ought to get the same credit. Um, and so I think at this point, at least the dialogue I hear at the senior level, it's less about trying to be URL or becoming URL and just ensuring that we maintain equity. Um, I do think over time, if we achieve that equity, then you prob there probably will be a good argument for why would we be separate. Um, but I think we're a long way away from that. And I think right now what we need to focus on is ensuring that given our contribution uh, to the Navy uh, and what we bring to the fight, um, that, we, that we get fair treatment under the personnel system and the personnel rules uh, and how we manage our community uh, and what we're afforded to do uh, in terms of professional opportunity. Um, and just a quick question off that. So, and I know there's many in the community who want to have us go unrestricted versus restricted, but do you think it would be necessary to, um, to have us go unrestricted in order to uh, ensure the equity at some point? Um, I don't know if we have to go unrestricted um, to get the same equity. I think we have um, achieved um, several of the goals that we set forth um, without becoming URL. And I think we still need some runtime on being, frankly, an integrated and competitive restricted line community. You know, meaning it's only been a couple of years that we have been competing across the IW designators uh, for promotion. Uh, we just integrated this year at the flag level, you know, for our selection uh, for IW flag across all IW designators. Um, and I think we need a little bit of space to examine and ensure um, that we're on the right path, that there aren't any unintended consequences of that integration. Uh, if that goes well, I mean, I'm confident that the caliber of the people that we're attracting um, and, uh, and how we're performing, um, that I think we would, fare, uh, we would fare well against our unrestricted line counterparts. And if anybody should be concerned about our integration, that maybe they should be concerned that we'd be coming in you know, and be more competitive than they are. Um, but of course, I, like everyone else, uh, at least most of the people in this session, I think I, I carry that bias uh, about how good um, our talent is and the young folks who are coming up through the community. Yeah, I think we're all pretty biased here for the IW community, it's true. <laughs> um, I want to skip to a question that uh, it seems like a lot of folks in our audience um, are interested in. And uh, of course, you being an intel officer, um, people are interested in hearing what your perspective is on this. Uh, there is the recent article in Proceedings by Captain William Bray titled, Intelligence is Not Warfare. Um, stating up front that decoupling naval intelligence from the information warfare community is key to ensuring the Navy maintains maritime superiority. So again, as an intelligence officer, what is your reaction and your opinion about uh, this article and his claim? Well, I, uh, I will tell you, uh, I know Captain Bill Bray well and, and consider him a good friend and he was a tremendous uh, intelligence professional. Um, but I, uh, I disagree with him on, on, this, uh, on this article. Um, I, I firmly believe that um, as um, uh, an intelligence officer and for those of us in the naval intelligence profession, um, that we have uh, benefited uh, from the integration uh, into uh, information warfare um, and that, uh, that we're on a good path. We certainly have to continue to examine that path, uh, make uh, course adjustments. Um, but I don't think it has threatened um, what we deliver, and if anything, it's enhanced our ability um, to integrate with the other information disciplines uh, and promote the kind of support uh, and uh, operational effects we can bring in, in uh, multiple warfighting domains. Um, I also um, uh, disagree with his point that I think he puts emphasis on intelligence being about analysis. And I feel strongly that although analysis and uh, deep penetrating knowledge of the enemy is important, um, we also have a role to play in operations, um, particularly on the ISR side. Um, and we do it in human as well, um, where I think we are operators uh, and we are the ones who have to decide uh, where to put assets uh, in order to collect the best information um, and enhance our understanding of the battle space. 
Um, so um, although I think it was a well-written article, I, I certainly uh, uh, welcome uh, the opportunity um, to talk about the path that we're on. Um, I, I do disagree and think uh, think we've done uh, we've done the right thing. And ha as someone who who has lived it, you know, having been cross-detailed to a communication station, um, I think I've only benefited uh, in my perspective of the Navy as a whole. And I've had a chance to bring um, my intelligence experience and perspective um, to some environments that I might not previously have had that opportunity. Um, and so, um, so I think um, I think we uh, we can continue to do the job we've done. Um, I think uh, we will be better integrated, um, and the lines are blurring too between what we do uh, as cryptologists versus Metoc Oceanography versus Intel. We're better when we're fully integrated. Um, and I think we're charged from the very beginning to provide independent voice on our opinion. So the issue on who you work for or whether you can have that independent voice, um, you're charged to do that throughout your career as a professional. And I think um, with the right training and support, um, we'll continue to do that and be um, effective uh, in all the, oper all the uh, environments that we operate. Great. Thank you, ma'am. And I know um, just hearing you and, and reading all the literature, integration is what we're definitely moving towards. And um, I think we'd be remiss in not having Intel be a part of uh, the IW community um, for that reason, because we, we build off of what we get from Intel officers, just as they build off of what cryptologists and MeTalk officers and IP officers have to bring. So um, uh, I would have to agree with you uh, on that front. Um, but it was an interesting article and it really generated, I think, the most discussion that we've had in our forums. And I think it's going to continue to generate discussion um, as, as there's various perspectives um, out there. Uh, so moving back, you mentioned um, being cross-detailed again at Nick Tam's Lant. Um, uh, that's that's when NAVI4 actually came online in October uh, 2014 when you were the CEO there. Um, so just kind of looking back and getting in perspective, what were some of your thoughts at the time and um, some of the benefits or even hurdles that you saw as it was being stood up, um, not being part of it, but kind of looking in from the outside before you got to be a part of it? Yeah, I have to tell you that when I was in command, um, I, I did have mixed feelings about the timing of the establishment of the TICOM. Um, certainly being a year into command, um, I had, uh, you know, I had worked hard um, with my command to uh, continue to mature the relationships we had with Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet, which at the time was essentially providing our TICOM-like support. And Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet, which ha also hasn't been in existence uh, that long, um, had also really started to mature into some of the support roles. And, uh, and frankly, um, you know, they have a great staff and we're doing um, some really um, effective advocacy uh, for my command. So like a lot of folks, when the change was proposed um, and knowing the effect that was going to have on multiple organizations uh, and being a subordinate who's, you know, dependent on, on support from those entities, um, I guess I would say, yeah, I was slightly chagrined about what that might mean um, for my staff in terms of additional work, how certain initiatives or efforts might be forgotten. Um, but on the flip side of that, having worked for Admiral Card uh, as his EA and um, where we were going as information warfare, I was, um, I was really excited that it was the right thing for us to do. Um, and I certainly talked to my command about um, the challenges the change would create, but the opportunity that it meant for us uh, in IW overall. And we had talked often within the command about uh, the challenges with Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet, that the um, capacity they had to look at both operational and readiness issues was just too much for one staff to be effective. And so we talked about how there would be new opportunity from an operational perspective um, to uh, engage with them and to allow them to be an advocate for, for us in that area, while a different command would take on the man, train, equip, you know, readiness role. Um, and certainly given the, um, the extensive uh, uh, experience I had on my staff and the fact that we were in the local area with the TICOM, an opportunity to offer um, uh, and in, you know, offer recommendations and influence um, how the TICOM was going to form. So, so it was a little bit of both. I, I mean, I, yeah, I have to say that um, with any change, um, yeah, sometimes um, 
you're not necessarily excited when change is announced or delivered at your door. Um, but I would tell you, as I told the uh, mid-career course, I was over talking to them this morning that um, you know, I think it's really important, especially as leaders, that you need to embrace change. Um, and you don't always get to decide when change is going to happen. Um, but you've got to look for the silver lining, the opportunity in that, and figure out how to drive uh, in a way uh, that you can influence and shape it, because uh, change is inevitable. And uh, and uh, in this case, I think it was a good change. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, certainly, if I'd been given a vote, you know, I might have voted that it happened after I left command, or you know, maybe it should have happened before I got into command. <laughs> Well, fortunately, you kind of got to see it while you're in command and um, get to formulate things that hopefully you got to implement while you were there. Um, but yeah, it, it sucks. We don't always get to choose our timing. Um, what, one other question, and again, uh, sometimes we'll bring up political things, but trying not to get too political, um, but just interested in your opinion on the state and future uh, decisions regarding U.S. CyberComp. Um, as you and most of our listeners are aware, um, there's been a lot of controversy lately regarding the hats that Admiral Rogers uh, currently wears, uh, being uh, director of NSA and also commander of US Cybercom. Uh, but without focusing too much on the politics there, um, do you feel that the two can be effectively separated at this point in time? And uh, what are some of the things that you see as either delaying or expediting that separation process? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I personally think that um, long term, uh, the two commands should probably be separated. Um, but I do um, think we have to be very careful um, about the path we take to affect that separation. Um, and that Cyber Command right now, based on the, the way it's resourced and frankly under-resourced, um, is extremely um, dependent on the expertise that NSA has. And I think Admiral Rogers and General Alexander before him have provided um, uh, really critical leadership across both organizations uh, at a time when Cyber Command in particular has been really formative. Um, and so I, I do think um, over time it would be um, it would be great for us to have a Cyber Command that is fully resourced and stands alone on its own merits. Um, but as we move on that path, I think we do need to be cautious about um, the interdependency with NSA, um, the value of the co-location, and that even if you separate the two commands, um, how much um, integration and processes need to remain in place to ensure a really effective flow of support from the two entities. Um, because even as two separate organizations, um, I think you know, one 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 really can't be effective without the other. Um, and so I, I do think, uh, I, I think I, um, I personally was pleased to see that, um, although we, it looks like under the defense bill, we're on a path towards separation, um, we're getting some guidance um, about trying to take a cautious approach. I mean, whether that holds or not um, remains to be seen, but I certainly am for one on this, that um, um, we, need, we do need to be really thoughtful on this one. And when we are talking about skill sets, that are in such high demand and still low density, uh, really careful um, about how we ensure they're rightly distributed between the two organizations if we're gonna separate them. All right, great, um, thank you. And is that is that something within the um, IWDC um, that's going to be addressed in terms of um, creating TTPs that uh, as as cyber um, cyber command matures and develops its own um, skill sets and its own um, I guess dependence um, from the NSA um, systems and architecture and skill sets is that something that's going to be looked at uh, maybe first in terms of um, uh, focus or is it just going to be kind of wrapped in with everything else that we need to move ahead on um, for the IW community. That's a good question. I'm. I'm actually. Um, I actually think we're going to be really challenged uh, when the IWC uh, stands up to um, to settle on what's the right first priority. Because um, the good news is we've gotten a lot of attention about the fact that we're creating a WDC. But the bad news is, at least in recent forums I've been, is you know, everybody's looking to it already to provide solutions in a number of mission areas, you know, where we have complex challenges. And so we've got cyber issues. Um, I heard a couple weeks ago that, you know, when we talk about maneuver and the integration of space, 
um, with our communications. Um, that wouldn't it be great if the IWDC looked at that? Um, you know, what are we doing um, in terms of uh, uh, intelligence and ISR? What's the right construct there? And that we need analysis done on the right number of people. What are the right analytics and tools we should be using in that area? Um, you know, I could I could give a long list of challenges and opportunities we have. And so, um, so I do think we're going to have to be really thoughtful about what we prioritize first. Um, I will be. Um, Frank with this group that Amo Kohler has certainly um, committed to the IW commander construct and the development of doctrine against that as one of the top initial initiatives. Um, and the group that is already uh, forming the base of the IWDC is working to pull together all the existing doctrine and TTPs we have across the IW mission sets. So I know when Captain Watkins comes in as the new CO in February, that one of the things he is looking at is exactly that, given what we already have in existence, um, where do we need to focus first? You know, which areas are, are uh, so severely underserved, you know, that we need to we need to get on them now and where maybe can we hold the line for a little while while we continue to build out the capacity? Because I, I think everybody knows we're just we're not going to be able to take on everything effectively um, at one time. Yes, ma'am, it's a it's a huge undertaking. So I know um, uh, a lot of us in the community are really excited about seeing uh, the IWDC stood up and, you know, seeing where um, where it kind of goes over the next couple years, um, but there is a lot to do. So um, I think we're, we're kind of near the end of our time. Uh, do you have time for one more question? A couple more questions? Certainly. Okay, um, there is another one from the audience. Um, we've all seen that the cryptologic community um, has come out with a cryptologic community vision. Um, are we going to see the same from the other uh, IW communities, IP, Intel, or MeTalk? Well, I know um, from an Intel perspective that uh, Admiral uh, Sharp is our Intel community leader, uh, has been working with us on uh, an Intel uh, vision. And he was you know, directly inspired um, by the uh, cryptologic one uh, that was published um, earlier this year. And so we have a draft in circulation. And uh, I think he is uh, optimistic that at the beginning of the year, um, we would publish uh, something similar to articulate um, as he calls it, the why of Intel, um, you know, why we exist and then what we bring to information warfare. Um, I don't know if the IPs and MeTalk have similar efforts uh, in motion, uh, and so I can't directly address that. Um, but I do know that the leadership of both those communities, um, you know, particularly Admiral Gallaudet driving MeTalk, um, he has clearly brought vision to a lot of how they're organized right now. Um, and. Uh, um, and they may very well be working on uh, something similar. All right, great. Thank you, ma'am. I had some technical difficulties there. Um, let's see, uh, one last question. How do we see uh, changes affecting the fleet regarding cyber being a new separate area of evaluation under the revised um, uh, Surface Force training manual? And that's a great question. I think, um, yeah, I have, I have mixed feelings about the cyber initiative under SURF 4, meaning I think there's goodness in the fact that the surface forces recognize that they need to lean in uh, in this area. Uh, and they have put together a training continuum uh, in the basic and intermediate phase um, to get after how they support their ships and meeting uh, pretty steep requirements. I think most folks in the audience know it's hard to pass a cybersecurity inspection um, as a ship. Um, there's a lot of complexity to ensure you're in compliance. Uh, and their effort is really trying to get after um, how they try and alleviate the burden on the ship uh, by bringing resources in to train them, uh, educate them, and, and get them most ready. Um, I think my disappointment is, and where I'd like to see us go long term, though, is I think that that kind of training, IW training, is what the IWTG uh, should do. Um, and uh, and we really um, we really need to engage with Surf 4. We are engaged with them. In fact, we're supporting their effort. We have NAV I4 folks who are actually integrated in the teams that are doing the training. Um, but we really need to get after over time how we transition that to the IWTG and how we have IW leaders, you know, leading and providing IW training. And so I think um, we certainly should welcome and encourage um, when 
you know, our other TICOMs are, are focused and paying attention to critical IW issues. Um, but we still need to continue how to continue to look at how we grow our capacity so that we can bring, you know, the best IW expertise to bear in influencing uh, the outcomes in those areas. Awesome. Thanks. Um, let's see. I think, I think, ma'am, that is going to uh, do it for this evening. Um, I just want to, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I know I've learned a lot, and I think uh, we were able to address a lot of questions that members of the audience had. And uh, again, you've done a terrific job. Thank you so much. And congratulations again on your selection to Rear Admiral. And um, we're expecting a lot from you, uh, of course. But uh, again, thank you so much. And congratulations, ma'am. Michaela, thanks. Uh, you've been a great host. And I uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, and uh, hopefully have the opportunity to, uh, to work uh, with folks uh, going forward. Um, you know, as a last comment, I would put a plug in um, with all this opportunity, the comments and the questions. If you have an opportunity to serve at the TICOM, to go to the IWDC or the IWTG, um, we need you. Um, and so if you're an up and comer, um, I hope you look um, for those opportunities and seek those assignments to help us shape all of this uh, going forward because uh, it, it's certainly exciting times uh, in information warfare. Thank you very much. It is indeed. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was great having you on tonight. Thank you.